Oi, Toto Bim. Afeyna la shiran. Sava. My name is Mr. Popo and we are Popo. Welcome to this uh, compositing um, tutorial where I'm gonna guide you into how I created what and uh, I'm not gonna focus into telling you what light, what this, what this, what that. But most importantly, the reason I made this tutorial in the very first place is to tell you how to take something that you could just render as an animation that is really boring to look at to how to actually put it into something that would actually tell a story and is way more presentable. That is the word I'm looking for. All right, enough of me. Let's get right into it. There's so much that we need to talk about. Let's go! So before we get into 3D, you need to understand why we need to set up the stage. The reason behind this whole style frame and behind this, this whole project that you're working on is you want to present it in a well spaced and placed object. So what you do first is you set up the scene, you set up the stage around it. And the reason we call it as a stage and the reason we do this, it's like when you go and you want to take a picture. So the first thing, the reason why you go to a studio is because they have the right setup, the right stage for the production and for showcasing the main object, which is you. And the way they do this is they put three lights in a stage. Everything is well balanced so that it's not over bright and it's not too dark and the shadows are not too shadowy. They're not too dark. Now, the way to create this in 3D is very simple, just like we would do in real life. We're going to set up a floor, we're gonna put the object there, and then we're gonna put three lights around the object. Three lights. One we call the key light, that's where all the light is focused, that is the main light where you wanna cast the real light. And then we have a fill light. Fill light is a light that we create to only help you not have those really dark shadows on the side. Because if we have a bright light here, we're gonna have shadows here. So the fill light just helps so that those shadows shadows are not so dark. And then we have the backlight. The backlight, the reason we use it is to bring up the object even more because you have these shadows casted on the edge and then it helps you bring out the shape of the object. Now that we created three lights, let's see how we can balance them perfectly so that our object is there and it's not too bright. When you create a light, Everything is 100% intensity. Now, we need to balance things out. We need to give more importance to the key light and the fill just a little bit and the backlight just a little bit. And the rule is to have all these lights equal 100% or equal 1. So the key light, we're going to give it around 50%. The fill light, we're going to give it 30. And the backlight, we're just going to give it enough, which is 20. Now you can see that our object is well lit. And to see that this is really well done, if we have a fillet and if we have curvature in our object, it's going to respond really almost perfectly with the light. And that is a good sign that we are actually lighting our object pretty well. Now there is one more trick and one more thing that you need to know about 3D lights. Inside your 3D softwares, you most probably have a dome light. A dome light is a light that acts like a sphere that is around your scene, that is around your object. And when you give it a certain type of file that we call HDR, what happened is this sphere, this dome light is going to simulate that picture. So whatever bright areas that are on those pictures, they're going to act like light sources. And whatever there is dark, they're going to act like shadows. So you can rotate this dome light, you can increase the intensity of this dome light. You can even have the light without even seeing it. And that is the beauty of dome light. Sometimes you don't really need to set up your three-point lights. If you have a picture of a studio, it's going to actually simulate that three light points because it's already there. And in most of my projects, what I do is I try to set up this dome light way before I start setting up my three-point light. Because if my dome light can actually give me exactly the look that I'm given for, maybe I'm in a cavern, my Maybe I'm in a studio, maybe I'm in outside, in a land, in mountains. Why would I need to bother about doing this three-point light? Now, as you go on your professional career or as you start working a lot with clients and a lot with personal projects and a lot with official work, you start having less and less time to create and you have to be really fast about creating whatever asset that this particular scene and project need. And that's where 
kit batches come in. Kit batches are this kind of like the templates of objects and 3D models. So what happened is you save your time either by buying someone else's who spent time into creating a floor, ceilings, computers, and digital assets, or you spend your weekend and you try to make more ceilings, more loops, more VJ loops, more tunnels, more mechanics, so that when you need them, for a certain particular project where you don't really have time, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So kit patches are there to save you time and avoid reinventing the wheel. Because if something already exists, why redo it? You could just use it and make it even better and improve on it. That is the idea behind kit patches. We knew time. So when you import your OBJ or when you import your kit batches, whatever they are, you're going to have them lined to each other so that all you need to do is pick whatever you feel like you want to do, whatever you want to take, you take it and you start placing it in whatever scene or whatever object or whatever reason why you got this kit batch in the first place. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning kit batches and the reason why I put them as a separate topic is the way you use them. When you just first start, what you do is you import your kit batches and you start picking one by one. And if, for example, you have a wall, what you start doing is you take it, you duplicate it, you duplicate it, you duplicate it, and you make this huge wall. Well, that's good, but not really good enough because you're gonna face a problem when you're gonna have a bigger scene or just a medium scene, but the biggest of all problems is render. Render time is gonna be exponentially huge. And the reason is you're taking the same asset and you're duplicating it so many times. So your 3D softwares, whatever, Cinema 4D, Blender, Maya, 3ds Max, they're gonna have to calculate each and every wall on its own. And if it's heavy, it's gonna take a lot of time. And even if it's not heavy, it's gonna take a lot of time that you could save yourself. And there is a reason why I put this as a separate chapter, because the way you go about Kate patches is that you don't duplicate them. You use them as an instance. For example, in Cinema 4D, if you go here and click right here, your Cinema 4D is going to create an instance, a perfect copy. If you change this kit batch, it's going to change everything else. And that's really time saver. And what you do this way is that you can duplicate him no matter how much. And your render is not going to slow, your preview is not going to slow, because your 3D software is not recalculating every single instance. It has already calculated it once, it's not going to do that again. So you Using instances is really good when you're gonna have to duplicate assets. Does this work only with kit patches? No, you can use it with anything else. Here we are inside the project, and this is our setup. I like to put everything that is about the scene alone in a separate null, and I like to put all my lights and cameras outside of those scenes, and they are grouped according to what view I'm looking for. So for example, you can see here that I have my scene where everything is posed. Let me show you. Here is me using the exact same technique of instances when it comes to all this again. So you can see a lot of instances. And then I placed my machine or my device inside there. Now, then I use the three point light technique. As you can see, there is a light in front and uh, there are two lights. These lights are being used more of a helper rather than the original main light. Because if we go, for example, into um, the second shot, which is this one, you can see that I already have my dome lights. So if we turn this on, you'll be able to see that I have set up the mood for this already. And the way I did this, if we lock this in here, so the way I set up my scene is very specific to this very exact camera angle. So I place this light in a way where I can only see them in this camera scene, because this is not a movie. This is just me presenting my UI animation. So instead of me just trying to make this realistic as possible, no, I'll just have to cater 
to what kind of mood I'm looking for. Again, as you can see here, I set up these certain lights and these lights were made just so that it casts a little bit of light on that device and it looks like it's actually in a certain room that is futuristic and that is clean uh, and all the good stuff. Now, these lights right here that, that we can see here, these lights are more of a helper to showcase how good and how bright is this whole room. And what I tried to say is like, this is like a pharmacy. This is like this kind of um, delivery services like we see in Bed Stranding. It's not too much light, but it's just enough just so that you can see this and you can not have this bright light coming from the device that can hurt your eye as a delivery guy or as a astronaut or a future human being in Mars. And then we have our main um, dome light, which just acts as a environment environment again light helper and now if we try to zoom in if we try to stop this and go into scene number two if we just try to hide all this you'll see that i have a whole different setup so for this one what i did was i placed this light right here as you can see on the render i placed them exactly there just so that they can fit this style frame i don't need this to be functional i just need it to help me create this style frame, that's all. And that's one thing that you should always keep up when you're working with VFX and CGI, is that if this is just a particular shot where you need these kind of, for example, leaf tree or light, you don't need to create the whole tree. You don't need to create exactly what is holding the light. You just have to create that thing, that fake view. And so you can see here is I have first my uh, dome light, which is giving me a little bit of the environment. And I use two area lights just to light this up just enough so that I can give the extra mood. And for this particular scene, while you can see that there is a bright area here, it's for only one purpose. And that is because I always wanted to practice having light with dust. So I took this opportunity to practice dust compositing on style frames. So I made a lot of light just so that I can practice doing dusts. Another thing why I like this particular shot is because I wanted to showcase how we can use AOV or or passes so that we can solve compositing issues that I'm gonna show you later. Now, before we jump in and start talking about shaders and uh, uh, random passes and compositing, we need to talk about a couple of things, mainly your camera. Your camera lens and your camera position plays a really important role. There are many, many resources that I really advise you to actually go and have a look at. There are many courses that will train you at best. So having a very good understanding of how to frame your um, object is really important. Just for a very simple example, if we take an object and we put a camera from below and we look at it, that will give that object more of a glorious feeling, more of a dominance than if we just look at it straight or if we just put it on top. The placing of your camera really plays a big role. Sometimes your design is really great. Sometimes your, your UI, your shading, everything is so great. But the way you framed your main object is the problem, is always the missing link. So always keep that in mind and make sure you use the right lenses. So you'll hear this a lot, lenses, lenses, lenses. It's really important because if I wanna show a microorganism, there is no need for me to go with a wide lens. Like I could just go with like a, a 130 or 90 millimeters because I get to zoom in closely into that microorganism. If I need to show the glory of a certain area, I'll use a very wide lens, which is like uh, 20, uh, 10, something, I mean, something like that. So the lower you go, the wider it is, the higher you go, the more um, specific you are about a certain object. The second thing that I wanna talk about is how do I know when I am done and ready for compositing? You want, if you're asking this question, you won't know. And that is the problem. When I first started doing CGI, and as most of my friends, when we just first started doing CGI, it, we always tried to put everything as much as possible from the CG software. Uh, we just wanna get the volumetric here, we wanna get all the, what we could have just kit bashed on, 
compositing and stuff like that. We just try to put everything in there, but that's not how things work. So from the beginning, you try to get everything in CG. As you go in with practices, you start knowing what you could have just made in compositing and saved you time from rendering or even having the burden of creating it on Cinema 4D or any 3D software. So for example, as you can see from the frame, I literally started from nothing. Like I just rendered the object just as it is and then added a top of compositing on top because I am more comfortable with my skills and I know what I can do in compositing and what I cannot do. So to answer your questions really simply, you won't know unless you try. It's an annoying answer, but it is. It is what it is. And that's just how things are. You'll just know what you can do in compositing compared to your skills. Someone can tell you, oh, you can do that there. But if you cannot you yourself do that, better off just do it in 3D. And if you just want to learn how to do that in compositing, make sure that you can and you have the resources that will help you do that. If we get back to our scene and we look at it, we'll see that there are a couple of things that I could mention. The first is being, should we put the screen and the UI inside of Cinema 4D or should we do that in compositing? And that comes back again to the point where, what do you feel like? If you wanna have kind of reflection of that UI inside your environment, maybe you wanna render your UI inside of After Effects and then take that image sequence and put it inside of a shader of a material in the screen so that that UI can actually reflect around your scene or around your object that is having that UI. And one tiny little trick that I can tell you is always put your UI shader on an emission shader. That way you're gonna have that screen light effect. And then my favorite trick, I love this trick so much and I'm so excited to share with you guys this trick. Okay, so when you have your screen, normally you would go into your material and you put it as a glass shader and then that's it. Extra step, you'll probably put a grunge or some scratches or something like that. But then there is this one little trick that I really love doing in every single style frame that I've been doing throughout freelance and throughout the few years that have passed now. And that is playing a little bit with the reflection or refraction color and in the absorption. Oh my gosh. When you do that and you play with the color, you really get some reflections and some depth inside of that glass. The Bellissimo. <laughs> okay, the next issue is a little bit about compositing and that is something that you have to see before you start rendering. And that is, what do you need for your compositing? For me, I needed a couple of things. One, for sure, I needed a depth field. So what I did was I went and I created a Z depth pass and it depends on what kind of render engine that you're using. So I'm using Redshift, so it's pretty, pretty simple now with the new updates. And then I needed a very particular kind of AOV and that is called the set mat, those puzzle mat passes. Why do I need this? I need this because one of the scenes I had a little screen that was on top of the machine that was actually covering the UI. So am I gonna go inside of compositing and start masking one by one and little by little and go in one frame by one frame? What if that is like a minute or something? That is not good. Why would I waste my time if I could just not? If the solution is just there with one click. So what I did was I went and I created a puzzle mat and you do that by setting up a object ID and go into your set mat uh, AOV and just check in what kind of colors and what kind of object IDs do you want. So when you render, you get a pretty, pretty pass that helps you a lot for masking. And with this, we've done it. We have finished everything that we need from 3D and Cinema 4D, whatever 3D software that you're using. We are really ready now to take our passes, to take everything that we did in 3D and start compositing in After Effects. But that, that's what's happening next week. Next week, we're gonna be taking a look on how we're gonna import, how we're gonna dissect these render passes, how we can use the full performance of our compositing tricks so that we can take this UI and this UI animation to a whole new level that is presentable. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Don't forget to hit that like button if you really liked it. Put something in the comment. It's always really nice to hear your comments. My name is Mr. Popo and we are Popo. I'll see you on the next one.